Whether it's new construction in a site with less than perfect topography, or a project to rescue a property from encroaching earth, soil nailing is an increasingly popular option for preventing costly and even deadly landslides. And in this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, we'll be talking with Eric Fjellstad, PE, who is a geotechnical engineer from IGES, also known as Intermountain Geoenvironmental Services. We'll be talking about the use of soil nails in engineering projects and some of the main points you should consider in the design process of a soil nail wall. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the show, Eric. It's good to have you here with us. How are you doing today? Doing good. How are you, Jared? I'm good. I'm good. We're looking forward to this conversation, so I'm glad you could carve out some time for us. And to set the stage, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what is it that you do on a daily basis? Yeah, so I'm a geotechnical engineer in the Salt Lake City area at IGES. Um, I work on uh, geotechnical investigations from going out in the field and logging the test pits for the borings to writing the report, assigning the lab lab program. But I also work on the on shoring design, doing soil nails, soldier piles, sheet piles. Um, so coming up with those designs and uh, having to go out in the field and do some testing. I was recently just out in the field, uh, came back in to, from doing some uh, verification tests for a soil nail and a micropile. Excellent, excellent. So we talked about a lot of different technologies on the show. We talked about a lot of different, uh, you know, geotechnical engineering solutions. But come to think of it, we really haven't talked much about soil nails. You talk to us a little bit more about, you know, what are what are soil nail? What is a soil nail? Uh, when would one use these in an engineering project? And perhaps you want to talk about some soil nail projects. Yeah. So soil nail construction, it's a it's a top down construction method. Uh, so if you had a hillside. Um, you would start by excavating down a little bit, injecting the soil nail into the cut face, and you would go along horizontally. You'd lay down some welded wire mesh and then spray that with some shotcrete, providing you the retention uh, for your hillside so it doesn't fall down. Uh, soil nails, they can be used in a variety of projects, whether it's for a large basement excavation, like for a large uh, building downtown, uh, it could be used for uh, providing some global stability support. If you're in an area, say a landslide prone area that has some weak soils and you need to shore up the, the hillside so you don't get uh, some movement when you start to develop that area. All right. Thank you for that. Now, now, what are some of the things that somebody should be looking for if they're doing construction observations during a soil nail installation? Yeah. So a lot of projects that require soil nails will have someone out there doing uh, observations, doing QA, QC on these soil nails as they're getting installed. Um, and, the, and the design, there's gonna be, a, gonna be quite a bit to it to someone that may not be familiar with soil nails. Um, and so if I were talking to someone in the field, the things that I would recommend to them are, you know, make sure that the soil nails are going in at the right spot. Make sure that the lengths match with the height that are, that are being specified at that, that location. Um, make sure, you know, look for the bar size. Is the bar size right? Um, are they putting it at the right angle? Is the inclination of the bar right? Um, and so those, those are some pretty basic things that can be watched for as you're out in the field. Um, you know, as the project gets going, you might get a feel for how the, the nails get put in, whether they're using uh, an open hole, using an auger, and kind of blasting the, the soil out of there. They use an injection bore method where they'll use a, a, a bar that is hollow on the inside 
flow and grout through the middle and uh, return the spoils that way to, to get the, the bar to, to stay in and grouting it in place. So making sure that there's good grout, grout return at that phase so that the, the soil is uh, coming out um, so you know that you, you're getting a, a good bond with the, the soil and the, the bar. Um, the other thing that's uh, important to watch for is uh, you know making sure that when they are applying the shock creep and uh, the welded wire mesh, making sure that those are of the right size that they match with what's in the in the design documents, and that the contractor isn't trying to cut corners. I know I don't want to speak for all contractors or their relationships with their their engineers, but you know I've seen sometimes, and maybe it's that the, just the contractors they um, they just don't know better or they're just making a mistake, but we got to all watch for each other and make sure that we're keeping each other honest on these projects. Okay. Uh, if you're a little on the unexperienced side and you're seeing this for the first time in the field, senior engineer says, go document the construction of this, the soil nail wall. What are some of the things that, um, some of the areas you need to focus on, I guess, the specifications, design documents, uh, what are things people should be looking for? Yeah, so certainly uh, getting familiar with the, the design document that's uh, being used for the project. Um, another great reference that I would put a plug for is the FHWA manual for soil nails. Um, so I believe that's the GEC 7 is what we refer to it as out here. Um, and so looking at that and, and seeing what, what it says, what does it say is necessary for something like a verification test or a proof test, something that you might see while you're out there doing observations on this wall um, and understanding you know, what, what those things mean. Um, yeah, just being familiar with, with the design document, being familiar with the, the FHWA guidelines. So that way we can, uh, that the, the project can be done correctly. Okay. And what are some of the main points when you're thinking about soil nail design? You're right. GEC seven is really the governing document there. What 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 are you thinking from from a design standpoint? You're responsible for the design for the wall. Yeah. So when I go and do a design uh, for a soil nail wall, uh, most of the time there'll be a geotechnical investigation done beforehand, and um, you know they'll probably include boring logs or, or test pits. And they may or may not have strength testing. And so you got to have some engineering judgment as to what those soil strengths are that you're going to use for, for modeling. And so having the judgment to know how many layers to use or to use just one, um, depending on the, the situation. And then understanding, okay, we have this, this geometry, we have this retained height, we have these soils. Now, what about loading conditions? What sort of loads could this project see during this uh, during the construction life, whether it's a temporary and it's just seeing some construction loading, maybe a crane up above, or during the if it's a if it's a permanent wall, is it seeing some seismic loads, or do we need to account for seismic loads, um, or other you know could it be an extra road and we got to account for roads in the future, things like that. So that way, when you're you're modeling it, you you come up with an appropriate uh, outcome, an appropriate design, the, and then you can look at, okay, we've got the, the soil, we've got the loading, we've got the height, then we put in the, the lengths of the, of the soil nails and start looking at what sort of factors of safety are we getting? Are they appropriate? Do they meet the minimum standards for the, this project? What do we know about the contractor, contractors that are gonna be bidding on this? Do, are we comfortable with the work that we've seen them do before? Or do we need to uh, maybe use some, uh, some higher factors of safety to account for maybe some of those corners that they might cut? So that way, if something does go wrong or a verification test does fail, uh, the design can still go forward and uh, not have any hiccups. So let's see what what are you using for your modeling is it snails or what are, what are you using for your actual modeling? yeah yeah so i'll use snails for for doing the modeling okay 
All right. And after you come up with a layout of the soil nails for, say, a given height, uh, given loading, what factor safety are you, are you using or what are you targeting? Um, yeah. So typically for temporary, we'll target a factor safety of 1.3. Mm -hmm. And then for permanent, 1.5. And then here in Utah, we have to look at seismic. I mean, everywhere we should be looking at seismic. The seismic is something that can control here in Utah. And so for that, we're looking at 1.1 factor safety. Okay. And you're saying that, you know, based on the, the bidding list or local challenges, you'll put a factor on top of that, or you'll increase factor safety as well. Yeah. I mean, we won't come out and tell them, mm -hmm. but uh, no one. Okay. Yeah. We, we can ride the line a little bit closer to the 1.5 or maybe in, if we know Joe Schmo contractor is going to be getting it, we need to maybe go a little bit heavier. Got it, got it, got it. All right, cool. Well, thank you for that. Well, before we uh, and we'll 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 put a uh, in the show notes. We'll 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 put a link to GEC seven so that the folks uh, for folks who haven't seen it before, uh, they know where to find that. But before we take our break, yeah, for sure. Final final piece of advice you want to give the geotechnical engineers that are listening or watching. Yeah, the the final piece of advice that I'd give to to engineers or that are listening is to to be willing to work with the contractors that are that are doing the job, uh, you know, you may come up with a design, and maybe something doesn't get done exactly right. Um, you know, be willing to look at the model and see if you can change something to make it work with what is out there, and not be so inflexible that that problems come up. Got it. Well, thank you so much for that. Really good to to think about. I mean, the reality is that. Uh, engineering consultants, engineering inspectors, or folks playing uh, playing a role of providing the oversight, and, and contracts. We got to work together. We got to do it. So, so thank you so much for yep. that. We're gonna come back in just a minute and close this one out. And Eric and our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Eric Fielstad, PE, a geotechnical engineer from IGES. Now, Eric, it's funny, we already kind of talked about factor of safety, talking about these walls, but um, you, you've had a very successful career already. And we look back in your career, what's one thing that you've implemented to give yourself, call it a career factor of safety? Yeah, I'd say what I've done to give myself a, a factor of safety in, in my career is uh, to be willing to, to do the jobs that other people don't want to do in your office. Be willing to, to step up and say, yeah, I'll, I'll go work out in the cold and, and do that field work, or I'll take on that project that I know the client may be demanding. And be willing to, to go the extra mile and put in the extra effort to, to do those jobs that may be a little uncomfortable. And I, I feel like that has uh, paid off for me. And, and helped uh, open opportunities for me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you uh, coming on the show and sharing all the great insights with us. And it's possible as you shared information that will be very helpful for our listeners. I know you did. But uh, if listeners wanted to reach out to you or find you, what's the best way for them to reach you? You have an email you want to share or you're on social media? Yeah, I'm uh, fairly active on LinkedIn. So if people want to reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn, they can. Um, if they really want to send me an email, their, their choice, I guess. Um, but my email is uh, E-R-I-K-F at I-G-E-S-I-N-C dot com. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, Jared. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 69, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.